Welcome students, faculty, alumni, and special guests to the USHA CO Forum at Carnegie Mellon. My name is Gary Flitz, the chair of the Undergraduate Student Senate, and I would just like to thank you all for being here today. Several years ago, the Student Senate, in collaboration with the USA Today, brought to our campus the Campus Leadership Program, which provides free daily printed copies of the USA Today, New York Times, and Pittsburgh Post-Gazette to Carnegie Mellon. In order to promote this program, about 18 months ago, the Student Senate, with the help of the USA Today, and later the Tepper School of Business, through the WL, L, WL Mellon Speaker Series, began working on this CEO form. One of my favorite things about Carnegie Mellon is that if a student has a vision, the university will do everything in its power to make it a reality. Over the past 18 months, the Student Senate has received tremendous support from both the Tepper School of Business and the university administration as a whole. Before beginning this forum, I would just like to personally thank the entire Student Senate, in particular Rotimi Abimola, uh, who helped to organize this event, and Scott Street from the USA Today, who always had the best interest of the Student Senate in mind when helping coordinate this forum. At this point, I have the pleasure of introducing to you the president of this university, Dr. Derek Cohen, who will be introducing our guest speakers. Dr. Cohen has been president of Carnegie Mellon University since 1997. After receiving his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD in civil engineering from MIT, President Cohen had a tremendous amount of experience teaching and researching at both Johns Hopkins University and Yale University. During his time here at Carnegie Mellon, President Cohen's focus has been on innovation and growth. With an emphasis on issues such as interdisciplinary learning, the environment, diversity, and international initiatives, President Cohen has been a driving force in helping Carnegie Mellon become one of the most respected universities in the world. Through my limited interaction with President Cohen, I have quickly noticed his passion to help others. A tremendous listener and champion for students, President Cohen is well respected by the Undergraduate Student Senate, the entire student body, and the campus community as a whole. Please help me in welcoming President Cohen. In my office right now, I wonder if that's maybe my mother. Thank you, not like an introduction, Derek, for your great leadership. He's what tires me to bring the USA Today CEO for Kerry Curry Bell and we're delighted by this. And uh, congratulations, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. It really is an honor and a pleasure to work on email and host this, uh, not only because uh, the CEO for it's an important institution program, but because it brings our midst a uh, wonderful organization and a great CEO. The forum will be moderated by David Huberman, who is senior media reporter for the money section of USA Today, which makes him one of the most read business journalists in America. He's worked in newspapers since 1994, covering everything from the rapid rise of the internet to the ongoing globalization of the entertainment business. And likely, he's been spending a lot of time covering the Hollywood writer's strike. David will be talking with the CEO of one of the largest and most successful business organizations in the world's history. With its roots in Thomas Edison's electric company, GE is now more than a century old, older even than Carnegie Mellon University. And like Carnegie Mellon, GE has been in transition almost to the day it opened its stores. Innovation in its products and processes has been crucial in the success of GE as it has been at this university. Today, GE's businesses include healthcare, finance, media, security, energy, electronics, appliances, and many more markets. And in every one of the markets that GE operates in, it is or rapidly becomes the leader and dominant 
His organization, G, has stood in a separate standard for superb management. Features a relentless attention to operational excellence, disciplined approach to decision making, and a consistent focus on building the skills and the talents of the people of the company. No company anywhere puts this all together the way GE has and continues to do, which is why it was recently named the world's most admired company by both Fortune Magazine and the Financial Times. Another key is that GE's success throughout the years certainly has been strong and creative leadership. And Jeffrey Yenolt is a superb leader in the GE tradition. He's been twice named as one of the world's best CEOs by Barron's Magazine, a graduate of uh, Dartmouth College and uh, Harvard, where he received his MBA. Jeff Hillbell joined GE in 1982, rising quickly through the various divisions in which he served. He officially became CEO of GE on four days before September 11, 2001. So to say something, to say that he knows something about managing the face of the changing world is an understatement indeed. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Lieberman and Jeffrey Young. Thanks very much. Thanks, 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 Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all for showing up tonight. All they had to do was study for exams, David, so, you know. <laughs> they think they're going to find answers here? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Oops. One moment. Oops. Um, while I'm fixing this. <laughs> It's fascinating to me. People talk about their starts in business, and you went to Dartmouth, you went to Harvard, but I have a feeling that the most f important experience you had was at Duncan Hines marketing Moist and Easy Brownies. <laughs> Can you explain to the audience why? Yeah, you know, I, I, when I graduated from college in 1978, I, I uh, thought I wanted to go to business school, but I, I wanted to work for a little while, so I ended up working for Procter & Gamble for about 18 months, and so I showed up uh, and I was on the Duncan Hines Brownie Mix brand, a bullpen with maybe four desks. And the desk right next to me was uh, Steve Ballmer. And uh, so Steve Ballmer and I have been friends for 30 years. We were probably voted the two employees least likely to succeed <laughs> by all of our peers. I can't tell you how much sleep we got every night or you know, things like that. But Steve and I have been great pals for that period of time. And, and there was no know. secret ingredient in those brownies? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, OK? <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, well, this is an interesting time of year to be talking, because we're it's right at the end of the year. Tomorrow, you're going to be speaking to some Wall Street analysts. Next month, uh, GE has its retreat in Boca to, for executives. What's your message going to be? You know, what I would say is that uh, in terms of how we think about the company today, vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the world and, and our investors. But, you know, what we basically have always positioned the company to be is a, a safe and reliable growth company. So if you think about what you read in the USA Today in terms of what's going on in the world, there's, there's really kind of three big themes. You know, one is that uh, the U.S. housing market is in retreat, and the U.S. consumer is under real stress because of that. That's theme number one. Theme number two is that global growth has never been healthier. In fact, I, I've been in business for probably 30 years and I've never seen a time in my career where the global economy is less related uh, to the U.S. economy than it is today, which is, I, I think, generally a good thing, not a bad thing. So the global economy is moving at an accelerating pace in a positive. And then the third thing is that uh, there was a whole series of what I would call synthetic debt vehicles that just didn't work. Uh, uh, collateralized uh, debt obligations, uh, sieves. It was just a liquidity bubble. You know, it's probably the fourth or fifth one I've seen in 25 years. They're ugly when they end. What, what you're seeing right now isn't the way business is supposed to work, but it's not the last time you'll see it, and it's not the first one that I've seen. So what we try to tell investors is that in that construct, uh, this is a company that can still grow earnings 10%, can still generate high returns because of the diversity of what we have, because of the strength of our businesses and, and the quality of the risk management we have inside the company. 
Now, the one thing that's going to carry our company that will be a theme tomorrow that will also be a theme when we pull our business managers together is uh, globalization. 2007, for the first time in the history of GE, we'll have more revenues outside the United States than we'll have inside the United States. Our business outside the United States will grow between 15 and 20 percent next year. Uh, you know, we're a $172 billion company that's 125 years old. And in 2008, with the U.S. economy growing at 1.5 percent, we'll grow revenue by 15 percent. 15 percent. Because we're in the right places with the right products at the right time. So mm -hmm. with the management team, it's how do, you, you know, how do you take a quintessential American company, and even though a third of the people in the room will have non-U.S. passports, and make them courageous and bold and tell them that no matter where we are, we're not good enough. We've got to get better and we've got to get more global and we've got to do it now. We, so, can't, we can't wait. So domestically, you're not projecting a recession? You know, we, we use, <laughs> I learned the hard way, David. Guys, don't be an economist if you're a CEO. You know? <laughs> In other words, there, there'll be people on CNBC, everybody, you know, everybody will be listening to what I say tomorrow. And look, I got like B's in economics, you know, I say, I say holy cow, if only you knew, right? Okay. You know, I, CEOs are lousy economists. I, I take what the world thinks. The world basically pegs the U.S. GDP next year at somewhere between one and a half and two and a half percent. Uh, coming out of, we had a mini recession, let's say in 2001, 2002, it was very minor. The last four or five years have been four to, you know, three to four to four and a half percent. So one and a half is going to be slower. But basically, U.S. is in full employment. You know, there, there's a, interest rates are coming down rapidly. David, there's a, this doesn't have to be a recession in the U.S. Mm -hmm. if everybody keeps their wits and the Fed does what it can do and things like that. I, I just think it'll be a real slowdown because housing is really going to, you know, in 50 years, the median house in the United States has never declined. It, it'll, it'll decline in 07. It'll probably decline in 08 and might decline in 09. Mm -hmm. So that's... Now, you... You're not an economist. You rely on a lot of people to give you advice. At a company that you generate, what, $170 billion in revenues per mm -hmm. year? What's your sniff test to, so that, you, since you can't be an expert in everything, how do you know when you're getting good information? Well, you know, first thing is I have things I really watch. You know, in other words, I, I watch uh, rail loadings in the United States. I, I watch trailer rentals. I, I watch, uh, uh, you know, consumer delinquencies. I get these things every day. So I have, I have probably a dozen statistics that I've found over time are leading indicators of, uh, of what's going on, number one. Number two, David, you know, I don't let anybody, including myself, nobody in GE is on a for-profit public board, but I encourage all of us to be on not-for-profit boards, hospital boards, things like that. I'm on the board of the New York Fed, which I joined uh, three years ago, so I get a lot of you know, even though I didn't get A's in economics, I, I rub shoulders with the people that got A's in economics at least once a month and things like that. So I get, I get that uh, kind of coming my way, and I, I kind of stir it all up in terms of uh, how it feels and, 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 you know, talk to the board, and that's how I make the decision. The other thing I would say, David, is that the only way to run a company like GE of our size and, and mass and everything is uh, bad news has to travel as fast as good news. And you have to have a management team and a culture where bad news, you know, people are trained to give you bad news on losses, bad news on, on what's going on in, in markets. You know, I, I, for instance, I got, uh, you know, I, I, I get uh, a constant flow of information that's both good and bad. And, you know, that's what you want your management team to do. So you, you get all that coming at you, and you can make a pretty clear set of expectations, you know. But it's, you know, it's, it's a... It's a tough year to predict, you know, right, the economy we're in right now because, you know, our appliance business that gets sold through the contract channel, you know what, it's going to have a very tough year next year. And there's just no two ways about it. It's going to have a very tough year. At the same time, we're probably the second biggest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. It's about a $6 billion. We are sold out through 10. So you can't paint anything with one brush. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have some guys that you're saying, get more capacity, invest more, let's get more supply. And another team, you know, right next to them, you're saying, hey, watch your risk, watch your costs, don't get overexposed. Because, and it makes the time we're in right now, I think, a little bit more fluid than almost any time mm -hmm. I, can, I can remember. Now, when a company gets to be as big as yours, you, you suffer from the law of large numbers, right? It just gets, you have to uh, grow that much more for it to be meaningful. Is there any logic in splitting up the company? You know, look, we've sold, even since I've been CEO in the last five years, we've sold 40% of our revenue. 
So, you know, what I would say is that we're a company that always has to refresh itself. And I think we should always be very tough-minded about what fits and what doesn't fit. So uh, I, I think that's fair game, you know. But at the same token, we try to position ourselves in big themes where size is, is an advantage and not a disadvantage, and, and where we can use the girth, the breadth, and the depth of the company to be successful. So we've kind of picked six big uh, themes where I think we can use the totality of the company. The first one is infrastructure, infrastructure technology. You know, this is energy, water, oil and gas, things like that. That's a big, broad, high tech. That's a $70 billion business that will grow 15% a year for the next five years. Now, we're not too big. You know, that's a business where small people need not apply. You know, if you're a little 500, you know, I throw words around, but don't take me too seriously. I'll just throw them around and <laughs> I don't want you to feel like I'm, but a small little 100 or $200 million company isn't gonna be a winner in infrastructure. So emerging markets, you know, $32 billion of our companies in emerging markets. This is China, India, Turkey, uh, Eastern Europe, Russia, Latin America. Uh, that's going to pull the whole company along. So we're positioned in these big themes that allow the company to grow. And, you know, look, our incremental growth next year will be $20 billion. So we're growing a company each year bigger than Nike, uh, bigger than a lot of companies. But you can only do that if you make size an advantage and not let it be a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. One thing that interests me, though, because I cover the media business, mm -hmm. I, I saw a little bit of this when um, Rupert Murdoch started to launch his Fox business uh, network and was buying Dow Jones. The question that occurs to me is, how do you compete with someone who feels like he's on a mission from God? <laughs> no, no, Which, it's, a, it's a great question, I think. I mean, you know, he, he went out and bought Dow Jones. You could have bought Dow Jones. It, it's, 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 a, it's a great question because, you know, look, I, I would say... If anybody you should admire in the business world, it's Rupert Murdoch. You know, in, in other words, I, 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 I'm a rabid competitor with Rupert. You know, uh, I, I, I want to beat him so badly I can't even describe it. <laughs> but at the same time, when I drive home at night, I say this is one of the real guys I've ever met that I have immense admiration for. And he fundamentally, you know, look, I, I worry about investors, and when I share the morning, I'm worried about investors. He looks at the when he's shaving in the morning, says, hello, investor. <laughs> you know, how, are you, how are you doing today? Um, you know, so you've got, to have, you've got to have some disciplines about it that maybe he couldn't always have. Now, you know, in our case, when I looked at, uh, when I looked at Dow Jones, um, you know, David, there wasn't one person in the entirety of GE that knew a goddamn thing about running a newspaper. <laughs> Not one. So we're not, going to, we're not going to pay $5 billion for the Wall Street Journal when we have no domain, no expertise, just because he is? No, thank you. And when it comes to CNBC uh, competing against Fox Business News, we're going to try to crush them. In other words, we, we won't spare any expense. We won't, we, won't, we won't try to do anything other than totally beat them. And... I just view those as two different decisions, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, uh, we've had a long association with Dow Jones, the Wall Street Journal. We hope it, it would continue. If it doesn't, then we'll work with USA or we'll work with uh, Reuters or we'll work with somebody else. But, you know, so I put them in two different camps. Right. And, and so, you know, for me, when, I, when, when we want to win, um, I've got as many tools as Rupert does and maybe then some. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to paying a lot, he can probably do more than I can, <laughs> you know? <it's, laughs> so. Um, so where do you see your home runs this coming year? You mentioned um, that uh, uh, wind turbines is a big business for you, a lot of the ecological uh, areas. But what are some other areas? Infrastructure, huge. Emerging markets, huge, un unbelievable. Um, environmental technology, what we mm -hmm. call eco-imagination, uh, wind, solar, uh, biomass, uh, 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 batteries, uh, water desalination, uh, growing 25% a year. Uh, things that are fueled by demographics. Our healthcare business, early health, still has tremendous tailwind. And um, I would say the dig you know, kind of digital world, mm -hmm. whether it's in entertainment or healthcare, I think those are the four or five things that are really going to provide a tremendous amount of growth for us, even in a slowing U.S. economy in, 2000 and, in uh, 2008. 
So your move into the environmental business, I mean, you were one of the first who took a pretty bold stand mm -hmm. in going green. Was that strictly a moral decision? Was it strictly a business decision? How would you characterize that? I'd say it's more a business decision than a moral decision. You know, we were um, doing business reviews in 2003 or 2004. And again, one of the advantages of GE is that I can look across multiple businesses and try to see what big trends are. So when I spoke to our energy business, our rail business, our appliance business, really across a bunch of different businesses, they're all working on fuel efficiency, conservation, and greenhouse gas emission reduction. So, you know, our team got together and said, you know, this is going to be maybe a big theme. Let's, let's really study it. So we put together a team that went to study the science of, uh, of global warming. Uh, we put together a team that went and studied kind of the public policy of global warming. We put together a team that went to study how our customers felt about greenhouse gas emission reduction efficiency. And this is when oil was at 20 or $25 a barrel. So, you know, it, it's not where it is today where it's even more trendy. And I, I think we came to the conclusion that global warming is a technical fact, that, that we felt like public perception was changing. Uh, we felt like it wasn't completely popular with our customers, but they wanted some leadership. They wanted some positions to be taken. And so we launched it in 2005, what we call Eco-Imagination, but we wanted to make it very substantive. So basically, we committed to a certain level of technology. We committed to uh, having a certain level of customer engagement. We com committed to hard revenue numbers, and we committed to uh, reducing our own uh, uh, carbon footprint by 1% uh, uh, a year. So we did all those things at the same time. And you know, in that time period, the world's kind of uh, come our way. You know, uh, uh, there's about a 80% overlap between energy efficiency and, and, and greenhouse gas emission reduction. So as oil's gone up, it's been a natural uh, together. And look, I think society has just changed its mind about the environment in the US and around the world. And I, I've learned a long time ago that uh, when society changes its mind, business better get on board, get ahead of it, or you don't, you, you, you get crushed by it. And so, you, you know, whether it's on CEO comp yeah. or uh, energy or anything like that, you know, you better get ahead of it right. if you want to be. Now, I'm also somebody that doesn't believe that companies or CEOs should have hobbies. You know, in other words, uh, I want the company to have a great reputation, but if this was only about reputation, I wouldn't have done it. You know, uh, my name's not above the door. It's GE. I work for investors. And I, I, I really t totally believe that our reputation, first and foremost, comes from being a great executing, a high-performance company. And this extent to which we can do things by solving societal problems that also lead to our reputation, so be it. But I, I wouldn't have taken this public a stand mm -hmm. if I didn't think it was pro-investor first and foremost. How about the administration? Is President Bush doing enough for the environment? Look, I think President Bush understands it. I think uh, in the last year that he's got, you know, getting something done in energy and the environment uh, are things he'd like to do. Um, but again, I think it's going to be a big debate in the election, and, and you know, just it'll, this debate will go forward. And look, I run the company. I run GE assuming that it's a question of when and not if we get carbon caps of some kind. There's some kind of cap and trade. I don't know if that's going to be 09, 08, 0, you know, 10, 11, but it's going to happen, and I want GE to be positioned for it. Well, since today's the day that I think Al Gore gets his uh, Nobel Peace Prize, <clears throat> he favors a, a carbon tax. What do you think of, you know, isn't that a more effective, efficient way? To you know, what I would say, David, is that there's, you know, I'm, I'm a member of a group called the U.S. Uh, Climate Action Partnership, which mm -hmm. is a bunch of companies and, and, uh, and NGOs that really have banded together to try to be a catalyst for change. And our position paper really is about a cap and trade system. Um, at the end of the day, I think there should be a real dialogue between tax and cap and trade and things like that. I mean, there, there are certain things that something called a TAX makes it a little bit more controversial you know, than right. other market systems. But I think that there should be a market for carbon. There, there should be an economic. That can be delivered through a cap and trade. It also can be delivered with a tax. And if you have a real market mechanism that can measure these investments, then Innovation and technology will take root. But if you're a utility CEO today, let's make sure any one of you could be a utility CEO. And let's say you're 58 years old. 
and your company might be worth $20 billion, and you have to make a decision to invest in nuclear power um, today. It's a hard decision. You know, it's a $3 billion project. If you're 58, it's going to come online by the time you're long retired. You know, if you look at the most profitable energy asset in the U.S. today, it's a nuclear power plant. They're all 30 years old. They've been fully depreciated. You can price off the marginal cost of gas, and your cost is fundamentally zero. These make a boatload of money. The one thing they all have in common is they were started by CEOs that all got fired. Okay? <laughs> Everybody that made that original decision got, got it. So that's the decision. And with no price for carbon, why would anybody take that kind of risk that makes a 50-year decision based on you know, whatever the price of oil is or things like that? That's why these market signals are so gosh darn important in the end. But if, let me be sure I understand you. If someone said, tell you what, we'll get rid of all your payroll taxes, including Social Security, and have a carbon tax instead, you'd be OK with that? You know, David, I haven't studied it. Uh, I haven't studied it completely. But I think market mechanisms that drive conservation, ultimately, are going to be progressive for the economy over time. Mm -hmm. and whether or not that's a great trade-off, I haven't really studied that. But you know, I, I think they're going, to, they're going to put us in a better place over time. Right. Tell us a little bit about your experience with the subprime mortgage market. You bought WMC um, a few years ago. How much did you pay for that? You know, we paid, let's see, in 2003. We, we, we run a big financial services business. Um, we probably have $500 billion in assets and things like that. And in, in about 2003, we bought a subprime originator called WMC in California. And it was what was called an originate to hold uh, uh, a type of business, which was really pretty much commonplace in, in, in the last uh, four or five years. Um, we ran it for probably two or three years. We paid, I don't know, $400 million, something like that for it. Uh, when we saw, basically, uh, we tracked it very hard. We saw in the beginning, in the latter part of 2006, the market began to change. Mm -hmm. At the end of the first quarter of 2007, we basically made the decision to exit the business. And we exited the business at that time. And we probably wrote off $800 million, something like that, as we exited the business. This was a bad business decision. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it, was, it was the wrong business at the wrong time. Um, not the first time we've done it. Won't be the last time we've done it. But that kind of been the, was the history. So what's the lesson that you learned? How do you, how do you not make that mistake again? You know, I, I, I would say there's two lessons that I would learn uh, that, that I would go after. You know, one is, uh, it sounds simple, one is uh, the business model that was underlying, which we stressed, did due diligence, studied for months. You know, we didn't, we weren't cavalier about it at all. The fundamental uh, business decision that you could underwrite for somebody else to hold uh, an asset in the end just was flawed. And so, you know, we should have, all of the basic other businesses we're in, we hold ourselves. In other words, we underwrite to our own standards, we hold ourselves. And this was a unique business inside of GE uh, Financial Services. And the other one was, um, you know, when. You find something that doesn't work, exit immediately. And that's what we did here. Mm -hmm. you know, basically, you know, I try to explain to the board, you can look at it one of two ways if you're on the GE board. One is Jeff and Melt screwed up and cost the company $800 million. And the other one is by exiting in March, we saved $2 billion. <laughs> I'd prefer the latter versus the former. Uh -huh. But uh, look, I mean, I, I think if you run a big company, you're going to make mistakes. You know, you're going to make mistakes every now and then. We bought Kidder Peabody in the, in the 80s, sold it in the 90s. We, we, we got stuck on uh, auto loans in the late 90s. We, we had a private equity book in the late 90s. You know, so again, these are things. But you asked the important question is, you know, at, at GE, we tolerate, uh, we tolerate failure, but we don't tolerate a lack of learning. So basically, we only let you make the same mistake once. We don't let anybody make the same mistake twice. And that's, you know, that's the only way you can run, I think, a successful company of any kind. So we're not going to expect you to get back into the subprime 
I think that's pretty safe. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I, I think that's pretty safe, yeah. Um, looking ahead at 2008, I know China's going to be very much on your mind for a variety of reasons, one of which is that the Beijing Olympics will be taking place there, NBC will, will be there. What, and I know that you're, of course, interested in expanding other businesses into that market. What ancillary benefits do you get from having the Olympics? Well, the Olympics is the great global brand of all times. So, you know, in, in, in NBC Universal, we basically got out of all sports except for the Olympics and football, fu mm -hmm. fundamentally pro football, because uh, they're just a terrible economic equation. You know, it's, a, it's one of these things where, you know, there's, there's only so many things in life you can do as a loss leader. And sports, you know, <laughs> sports has a big appetite as a, as a loss leader. The Olympics are just a fantastic global brand. Their viewership is huge. For those 17 nights, you really captivate the world. And if you're a global company like ours, you get a, you get a natural positive spin by being a part of the Olympics that helps the totality of the company. So that's one that we've positioned with. We also signed up to be a, an Olympic sponsor uh, in 2003. So the Beijing Olympics will do about $600 million of other GE businesses, mm -hmm. healthcare, uh, electrical equipment, things like that. In London, we'll probably do half that, three or four hundred million dollars. In Vancouver, we'll do a couple hundred million dollars. So we do get company benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when I was uh, when I was young in 1964, the Tokyo Olympics were really the way in which most Americans got to see Japan for the first time. And Japan went on to become really one of the most important countries in my lifetime. Uh, for most Americans, this is the first chance you're going to get to see China. And I think it's going to be great TV, great theater. One of the things we were able to negotiate with the Olympic Committee is that uh, all of the events are going to be televised live, which fundamentally means that the uh, swimming uh, that you're going to watch at maybe 10 o'clock at night is actually going to be 9 o'clock in the morning in Beijing. Oh. So the athletes weren't so thrilled about it, but uh, we think it's going to be good for a great viewing experience for most Americans. But, okay, you'd like to do more business in China, and you've um, hung your hat on the environmental uh, issue. Here's a country that doesn't care. Um, well, look, I, you know, I would say a couple things about China. You know, I, I, I would say first, um, young Chinese who are your age are just like you. They want money. They want uh, clothes. They want uh, freedom. They want... Uh, uh, they want uh, to have access to the internet, they want everything you want, and they don't want to live in squalor. So the notion that the Chinese people for some reason want to have an environment that's horrible, that is, uh, that is uh, dirty and stuff like that, it's just not true. It's not true in the government, it's not true in the people, and it's, not, it, it's just not true. So I would say they do care. They've got a lot of work to do. and. Uh, and they're going to have to go and uh, invest, I'd say, tens of billions of dollars mm -hmm. to clean up China over time, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, David, what I would say is that uh, they're growing their economy at 10% a year. All the time that the U.S. in the last century was growing, it, it, this is their argument, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a want to, you know, be a, you know, give you a political manifesto or anything like that, you know? But, but their point of view is, at the time in which this country had great economic expansion, we could have cared less about, about the environment. And so we used coal, we did whatever it took to grow this economy, and they want a little bit of the same latitude. That, now, that's, that's their point of view. But I, I'm a firm believer that the environment in China and India has to be cleaned up, will be cleaned up, mainly because the populations uh, won't tolerate it any other way. And companies like GE, <clears throat> will be big benefactors of those investments. Are you in a position where you can put some pressure on them? You know, look, the basic answer is no. You, you know, in, in other words, uh, we're, we're investors, we're participants. We have a lot of influence. We, we may have as much influence as any other company, but in the end, we're not political beings, and, 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 it's, and it's hard for us to see our will uh, influence how that work ultimately gets done. However, uh, the extent to which we can be good advisors 
and the extent to which we meet with uh, government and politicians, we very strongly endorse and suggest that they should be working hard on their environment and environmental policy. And we're trying to sell them stuff mm -hmm. that helps them do it, whether it's coal gasification, whether it's wind energy, whether it's water desalination, to be an active participant in it. And human rights activists also say you should put pressure on China for their activities in Darfur. You know, again, I, I think that's uh, only going to get more uh, pace as we get closer to the Olympics. Uh, we've been a big contributor to uh, uh, a lot of the relief efforts in Darfur and throughout Africa, and will continue to be so, to do so. I think the Olympic Committee knows how we feel. And I think the Olympic Committee can be effective advocates uh, for human rights, just as GE can be. Mm -hmm. But basically, uh, I'm not a politician. I haven't run for anything. Um, and I think it would be uh, not accurate to assume that I carry political clout when we go around the world. I, mm -hmm. The decision that every company has to make in China is, are you going to be in or are you going to be out? That's the decision. And we can nuance it any way we want, but this is going to be at least the second biggest economy in my lifetime in the world, and maybe the first biggest economy in the lifetime of everybody in this room. So you can sit on the sidelines, we can talk about how terrible everything is, how awful everything is, how backwards it is, and how we wish they did this, that, and the other thing, as a sideline character. Or we get in the battle, we build factories, we try to, we try to establish political ties, economic ties, and I think if we don't do that progressively as a company, we're going to move back, as a, as a company and as a country, we move backwards and not forwards. So, you know, do I agree with everything? Do I like everything? No, but that's, you know, that's probably true with my mother-in-law as well, right? <laughs> but I love her, okay? <laughs> and, and so, in life, you've got to make, you know, you can talk about stuff, you can nuance it, you can debate it, but in the end, you have to say, I'm either in or I'm out. There's no half measures. And if you're in, you've got to be in all the way. You know? And if you're not in, you say goodbye to that chapter in history. You said you're not a political person. Have you, uh, does that mean you're not going to make any contributions in the upcoming presidential campaign? <laughs> you're tough today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my, I always tell people my, my main political party is GE. So I, I, have a, I have a real advocate. Um, you know, the company uh, has always stayed pretty bipartisan, I would say, and, and, uh, and I've tried to be as well. So I think, you know, w w will there be contributions? Sure. But I would say they'll be equally balanced as time goes on. Yeah, you haven't picked any particular candidates at this point. No, and won't. Okay. And won't. I, I just think it's not... Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a CEO of a public company. You know, in, in many ways, uh, the only reason why people know me is because I run a great company. And I, I, I don't ever want to confuse that with me taking a public position on stuff that fundamentally doesn't help G investors. And so I, I, I just think that's the right position to have if you're running a, if you're running a public company, mm -hmm. you know? So... In this election, one of the big issues is health care. And of course, you're one of the largest producers of health care equipment and also a major employer. Uh, what do you think of the health care system in the United States? If, if I could just broaden it a okay. little bit. You know, I, what I would say is that there's two fundamental debates in this election. One is clearly national defense, Iraq, things like that. I have no particular expertise, so I, I put that on one side. The other one, I think, is broadly competitiveness. And how will the US compete in an increasingly global world, and how can we make people self-confident that we can compete? And I think, and broadly competitiveness, that's about education, it's about health care, it's about energy policy, and I think it's about tax policy that encourages innovation. So, I, you know, I, I, I think in health care is probably, of those four, yet again, maybe the most complex, they're all, they're all yeah. complex in their own way. And, you know, I, I think, I think health care, broadly speaking, is, um, about 14% of the U.S. GDP, it's, it's growing roughly 10% a year. And if you look at the bow wave of demographics that are coming through in terms of how long people are going to live and how long the people that are living are going to be on the government dole, if you will, it's a big, 
challenge as you go forward. I, I, I would hope in the next administration that they could take on, you know, and it's, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, like when I was a student, you know, occasionally like in physics, I, I would study a problem and I would just walk away from it because it was too hard. I'd say, we'll see what the professor has to say about this one tomorrow. You know, healthcare is kind of that way. You look at it, and there's so inter many interdependencies. I think what I would like to see happen is we've got to do something about the uninsured. Mm -hmm. Who, whoever becomes president in in '09, it's just it's just uh, it, it it's it adds cost. It doesn't take cost away. It's a it's the wrong thing for our country, and we have to do something about that. I think we have to do something about the transparency of quality metrics, and have reimbursement follow quality in terms of outcomes. And that has to be broadly accepted, you know, in, into the system. And that, I, you know, in anybody that's ever run a company of any kind says as quality gets better, cost goes down. And the only industry I've ever been a part of that doesn't measure quality fundamentally in process quality is healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to do something about that. I think we have to do something about getting information technology broadly into the system. We've got to do something that modernizes the FDA and makes both new technology get to market faster, but have a way to measure its efficacy. And we have to have some form of tort reform. Mm -hmm. And so what I would hope is that the next president kind of step, you, you know, you could look at uh, Governor Romney's plan in Massachusetts. You could look at uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's plan in California. There's a, there's a bunch of plans that are being evolved. I think all of them have constructive uh, aspects to them and you know I just think whether it's a Republican or Democrat we need to take on a couple of these elements and get them going forward. Now the last thing I would say is um, health care in this country is one of our best industries. You know, in other words if all you did is read the newspaper every day, not the USA Today but the, let's say the New York Times, you'd say that <laughs> after you read the USA Today you know, you'd come to the conclusion that uh, every other industry in the United States is great, and the one that's horrible is our healthcare industry, because it costs too much and it's it's putting this horrible burden on the country. You know, healthcare is one of the few export industries we have as a country. It's a place where, look, if we if we do it right, if I live to be a hundred, China will never catch us in healthcare, and so we shouldn't dismember this important industry just because we get demagogued and, and things like that. So, I, I, you know, as you, as you plot your way through the next election, I think that's what, something we've got to keep in mind. So now that we've talked about health care, let's get to something really important. Uh, how long do you think the writer's strike in Hollywood is going to last? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it, the last time we've had a strike, a writer's strike, was in uh, the late 80s. The strike now has been going on for six weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, it, they've broken apart again. Uh, the argument is over something important. You know, typically, you know, I've been involved in lots of union negotiations myself. Uh, typically, when things are over, things that aren't important, they get settled, right? There's going to be some uh, chest thumping and things like that. They may go on strike for a little while, but they get settled. Uh, this is about something important, which is fundamentally how the digital revenue streams get sorted out between, uh, you know, really video com content companies like NBC Universal and the writers and directors and otherwise, and this is important, you know, so my hope is it doesn't, uh, my hope is it doesn't last too much longer, but uh, I think the differences are profound and to a certain extent they're worth, uh, they're worth taking a strong stand on. If it does last, will you end up losing money or will you actually come out okay because your costs will go down, cost for programming? You know, what I would say is that uh, prepare yourself for lots of reality TV. <laughs> so, you know, I'd like to put in a plug right now for maybe five nights a week of deal or no deal, <laughs> stuff like that, you know. <laughs> if you can get psyched for that, man, I'm your, I'm your guy. Uh, uh, you know what I hope happens, David, whether, you know, I, I hope the strike gets settled amicably. But I think everybody in the classic analog network business has to rethink their business model. And I hope that this is a foundational time when all of us really examine, you know, there's, there's, there's this one thing about, I know some of you might be in the business course or something like that, and you might want to write this down. 
you can't be in businesses where the revenues go down and the costs go up. Okay? <laughs> you, may wanna, you may wanna take notes on that, but, but that, that almost never works, okay? And so that's what's gonna be reinvented. Now, I would say broadly speaking, I'm quite fascinated by the impact that the uh, internet and digitization is gonna have in the entertainment business. And a lot of it's already taken place, but to me, it's, it's, about, uh, it's about three things. You know, it's really fundamentally about having great content, because great content always sells. The second thing you have to do is you've got to be able to dis distribute content um, with literally dozens of distribution nodes. I mean, if you go back and take a classic TV show like uh, The West Wing, let's take a classic TV show that many of you might be too young, but a lot of, a lot of people in the room would understand. That might be a billion dollar franchise. To get a billion dollars, you sell it twice. You sell advertising on air, and you sell a back-end syndication, you get a billion dollars. If Heroes turns out to be as successful as the West Wing, which I think it could be, I, I hope it is, and does a billion dollars, we will have to have sold it 25 times. We will have to have sold it online, globally, uh, advertising, in, uh, in your Christmas stocking the last season. And so companies that have good content and can mass the distribution are going to be successful. The third thing, you've got to figure out how you're going to get paid. You know, right now, we basically use Nielsen ratings. The system we're using is about 50 years old, fundamentally. And so I think what we've all learned from Google is that you can really get good online metrics about who is going to be using, who's viewing your content and how it's going to be used. And I think that's all going to take place over the next uh, probably three years. And, and, and the, the entertainment business is very fluid in that regard. Right. By the way, we wanted to leave some time for questions from the audience. We have microphones on both sides of the uh, auditorium, so if you want to uh, queue up there, we can uh, do that. If there's don't, be, don't be shy. Come yeah. on. Yeah. Okay, you... Just head right up yeah. to the mic. Yeah. Uh, how has Sarbanes-Oxley changed your life, if at all? It's made it a lot more fun. You know, I can't even tell you. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Um, Look, I think that the notion behind Sarbanes-Oxley is a right-minded notion. It says, basically, we should have processes in place that deliver uh, uh, good results to our investors and transparency. And, and really, it's been in place now three or four years, and I think it's fine. I, I think it's fine. I, I think, broadly speaking, though, you know, governance is really about uh, risk management, picking good people, and having the right strategy. And so one of the things I always worry about is that investors or business school students or things like that think that governance is somehow about a check the box mentality that if you check seven boxes, you suddenly have a company that's got good governance. That's really not true. Governance is about people, leadership, leadership succession. It's about having solid strategies that allow you to, uh, to grow into the future. It's about having sound risk management principles that keep your investors safe. So don't ever be mistaken about what really governance is. You know, and and that's, that's the only thing that, that I worry about sometimes. We have a question over here. Hi, boss. Uh, <laughs> I work with the uh, commercial team for Water and Process Technologies. And uh, I'm applying for the MBA program here, so I was wondering if you would put a good word for me. At <laughs> I think you just did the best thing you could do. Yeah. So I hope the admission staff is here. Uh, so. mm -hmm. uh, no, I was wondering, like, what, what recommendation or what, what's your advice for what skills that we need to acquire for leadership in, in from, for, you know, 10, 20 years from now, especially, in, you know, as it pertains to international business? You know, I, I think if I would give you, you know, we, we teach people inside our company on what we call growth leadership traits and, and um, uh, you know, and they're kind of five traits that we drill into our people. But if I try to project it into uh, students, you know, I, I would put it into uh, maybe three basic traits. I think it's curiosity. I think it's being good with people. And I think it's being, you know, having perseverance, hard work, thick skin, things like that. Those three things are three traits that every successful person that I've ever known, you know, has in common. Now, what I would say about business in general is that, largely speaking, 
I, I think most of what I learned when I was young was how to be a general manager. You know, in other words, how to, how to have transportable skills, how, how to have good process skills, kind of general management skills, things like that. Those will always be important. In, in other words, th they'll never be unimportant. But I, I believe that successful leaders in the next 10 or 20 or 30 years are going to have to be real experts, are going to have to be real domain leaders. They're going to have to know how to pick products. They're going to know how to pick countries. And so I, I really think what you should be learning is how to develop your own touch and feel for customers, technology, innovation, globalization, things like that. That's going to be a lot more important in the next 10 or 20 years than you know, uh, learning uh, how to be a good general manager, business policy, or some of those things that I learned 20 or 25 years ago. I just think the world has changed that much. And, and we're really in a what and where generation, not so much a who and how generation today. Um, thanks. Question. Book built to last. One of the comparisons was Westinghouse versus GE. Of course, we sort of know what's happened in the Westinghouse and, and here in Pittsburgh. And I think a lot of the reasons that built to last picked GE as a good company are, are the things you're continuing, which is great. One of the challenges, though, is they talk about culture, the company having to have a culture and sticking with it. And, you know, Jack Welsh had this policy of the sort of the t bottom 10% out every time or, you know, every year and that sort of thing. We were at some benchmarking where GE people spoke, and one of the people on my team commented, you know, those guys would play basketball to kill, not in any unethical way, but just very competitive. You know, every single person was very competitive, which is a good thing. But one of the things we see as a supplier to GE over the decades is that people keep rotating through, and so it's very hard to build a steady relationship, you know, as people move up. Again, it's not leaving GE, but moving up or moving through. And what we find is people push us on price, they go to the competitor, and then after a little bit they come back because, in fact, we give better service overall. But so, in some ways, GE is paying for that lesson over and over again because of the turnover. And so I guess my, my question to you is, you, you know, do a number of things right and have a good policy, but every policy or practice has downsides. What can you do or what do you think of doing in the future to help, you know, that long-term memory or that lesson learning sort of thing over time? You know, again, I, it's hard for me to address uh, specific, you know, kind of yeah. and my, situations my like that. isn't meant to be specific, but I just... You know, I believe that people ought to spend... Uh, I think people ought to spend more time in jobs, you know. I, I think one of the things that I've tried to do is uh, not have as much churn inside the company, and, and um, you know, I, I think it's a 125-year-old company. Uh, a lot of the businesses where we've been in for a long time, a lot of the supplier relationships we've been in for a long time, so... I think less rotation is a, is a good thing. But I think around culture, you know, cultures change. You know, in other words, if I would say, I want the GE culture to evolve and change. And I would say one of the things that makes GE a successful company over time is that there's probably only three bedrocks that the company believes in. You know, one is a commitment to integrity. The second one is a commitment to performance. You know, in other words, I, I want tough-minded people. I, I, I like it when we're doing an acquisition and the counterparty complains about how tough-minded we are. You know, I, I want a tough-minded company and a performance-oriented company. But the last one is a real profound commitment to change. You know, I, I believe that uh, we have a healthy disrespect for history. We have a healthy disrespect for you know, uh, uh, having people say this is the way we used to do it, we like evolving and change. And one of the places we try to change is actually trying to have more tenure in businesses and jobs. And I think if you look at uh, the median time in job just in the last five years has grown a full year inside the company. And I think that kind of, you know, domain expertise is, is good. But we also want a lower price. So <laughs> don't, 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 forget about, don't forget about that part. Great, thank you. I think one of the things GE's known for is its management training program and its ability to take young talent and mold it into leaders. We've got this new generation Y that's entered the workforce, and for many of us, uh, this is a new generation we see coming up that works differently, that has, I don't want to say fundamental different beliefs, but definitely a different approach to work. Can you comment on GE, uh, how you've changed your program, what you're seeing from that, that does your management program need to change? What are you facing? You know, I, 
I'll answer your question in a in a in a blunt way, but also a constructive way. You know, and, and what I would say is that Generation Y, whatever they're called, whatever you guys are called today, uh, <laughs> I've never seen people smarter, more curious, more worldly. And, and I think for people that are graduating from co you know, college as 22-year-olds today, I am so optimistic about the talent that I see and the types of people that I have. And I, and I think the difference is, you know, when, when I joined the workforce, you know, my father had worked for GE actually for 40 years. And my expectation was that I was going to stay with GE. You know, that's all changed in the last 25 years. People are mission driven. People are mission driven. So when I come to a place like Carnegie Mellon, what I say is, uh, don't be loyal to me, you know. What I say is, if you come to work for GE, you're going to be in the front seat of history. You're going to be in the front seat of history. If you want to see whether or not there's going to be an electronic medical record in the world, if you want to see if there's a cure for, for Alzheimer's, if you want to see whether or not uh, uh, biofuels becomes a dominant energy source, uh, you're going to see it here. You're not going to see it at some startup and some of those other crazy places. You're going to see the GE. You know, so I'm going to sell the mission. I, I sell the vision and the mission, and I find that generation, this generation likes the mission. Now, the other thing I would tell Generation Y, or whatever you guys are called, is that there's Generation A in India. Okay? Not B, not C, not X, not Z, Generation A. And they want what you have. So either with you or with them, I'm going to build a future for GE. You know, in other words, in other words, either with you or with them. But I'm not going to be tonight. I'm going to go. I'm going to take GE wherever we have to go, to be competitive and successful in the 21st century. But nobody here should be mistaken about the fact that there's going to be people around the world that want everything you have. That want quality of living. They want a second car. They want a vacation home. They want whatever they aspire to have. You know, tickets to see the Steelers, right? <laughs> and so somehow between that blend of this incredible U.S. university graduate that I see today that is so much smarter and more worldly than I ever was, somewhere between captivating their imagination and harnessing the hard work you're going to find everywhere in the world, you're going to, I'm convinced that the workforce 10 years from now is going to be better than the workforce today if you play those two streams the right way. Okay, you guys just stole my thunder a little bit, but um, I'm, a, I'm a pediatrician who's actually back in school at CMU earning a business healthcare focused degree. Um, and I've learned that doctors really stink at business. Uh, that was one thing. But the, the, my concern is the, the Generation Z. I've been reading a lot of uh, international corporations are putting a lot of funding and uh, support into international education programs to look for their future leaders. Uh, if you look at the recent scores of uh, U.S. students, I guess we're, we're faring fairly poorly. Uh, and my question was, does GE have a program looking to develop leaders internationally, and where, the, where are they going to be getting their leaders from in the next uh, generation? Yeah, you know, I would say two things. First of all, our leadership programs are really global programs. So we're, we're, we're both take, trying to take Americans and teach them how to be global leaders, but we're also moving people all over the world. And if you walked into a GE factory in China, you could eat off the floor. It would have Six Sigma, it would have Lean, it would have managers that could talk statistical process control, engineering. So everything we do in one place, we do every place else, which I think is important, number one. Number two, the G Foundation, we give about $100 million a year, maybe more, to secondary education globally, a lot of, mainly in the U.S., though. And this is to get uh, more uh, kids in high school to study math and science. I think that's a desperate need that we've got here and you know like this is a the university system in the United States is the envy of everybody in the world and and we have fantastic you know our our colleges and university systems have no peer any place in the world and the one big issue I, I think if you could just graduate more engineers who would study at these places and stay in the United States every successful country that I've ever seen if you said, what do they have in common? They graduate a lot of engineers. Or they have a lot of oil. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the other. There's a second way to win. Have a boatload of oil, right? But I, I, I just totally think that, uh, you know, really, you know, in my mind, Jerry has two jobs. One is to run Carnegie Mellon. And the other one is to make 15-year-olds want to study engineering. You know, and when you run a place like Carnegie Mellon or MIT or something like that, you really... That's, to me, the biggest 
educational issue that we've got in this country. Not enough people that are really strong in math and science, not enough kids that want to become engineers, and we've got to, we got to solve that. We've got time for one more question. You've talked about you know, working for investors. How would you say that your moral compass has been you know, affected by the decisions you've had to make and that you, you know, have to make in the future in regards to, I guess, China and just you know, green energy in general? That's a great question. Look, I, I mean, I, I think um, when you have a job like mine, you, uh, you have to make a lot of financial decisions, but you also have to make decisions where uh, you have to make them for a greater good. And uh, sometimes, you ha sometimes they're perfectly aligned, and sometimes uh, they're, they're more balanced. Um, and you have to have a good moral compass about what is, uh, what is right and what is wrong, and, and uh, be able to live with your own decisions. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't find that to be that hard. You know, is it hard? Yeah. But uh, the reason why I studied hard when I was all of your all's age and things like that, my, my parents are both big believers in education. And they said that, uh, uh, if, you know, it's really the great equalizer in this country. And it's a great source of self-confidence and freedom, really. I mean, if you have a good education, in many ways you're free, you know, and, and that's, uh, as I was growing in GE, as I, as I was placed in tough situations, you know, I always knew I could get another job, right? And so in the end, the decisions I always made was to do the job the way I wanted to do it. And I, I've, I've never had to make a compromise between doing my best and being the type of person that I wanted to be. And at the end of the day, that's the best you can do. That's the best you can do. So I think sometimes they come into conflict, but not that often. And you've got to go with your own compass when they do. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, David. It was a wonderful hour. I went by way too quickly. But a lot of wonderful messages for uh, the university, especially my colleagues in administration. Remember, if revenues are going down, the costs are going down. <laughs> But probably, probably we should be closing the university. <laughs> and I know the students all know it very soon. When Jeff gave his three lessons, three traits, curiosity, good with people, and perseverance. But the real message was, if you struggle with physics, and you got B's in economics, you too can be seen. <laughs> Jeff, you're marvelous. It's uh, obvious why you're uh, very chosen to be one of the best CEOs in the world because you are. And you communicate it wonderfully. Of course, to do so, you have to have someone who knows how to ask good questions. David, you did a great job. Thank you all for being here, and please join me in thanking these two wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.